Welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister, and I want to get straight to our show today because as stocks fall, volatility spikes, perceived safe haven yields hit record lows, and criminal LIBOR charges may be imminent. Things seem a little crazy as headlines even tout global economy in worse shape since 2009. It just so happens, lucky for us, a group of investors are getting together in Vancouver to figure out how to navigate this terrain right now for what we're calling a sort of anti-Davos. It's Agora Financials Conference. A lot of our guests are there, and its theme is Innovate or Die, Empire at a Turning Point. So we want to check in right away with the MC, Eric Fry. He's editor of The Daily Reckoning and chief investment strategist at Agora Financial to find out why all of these high-profile investors and economic experts are seeing such high stakes at this point and what answers they may have. So first of all, Eric, thank you so much for being on at what's uh, your big conference for the year to tell us all about it and also your insights. Thanks for being on the show. That's a pleasure, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So first, Eric, let's just touch on the conference briefly and what you think of my characterization of this as the anti-Davos, because also my producer tells me that you guys were talking about this conference and the attendees as financial first responders. So I'm curious your, your explanation of, and reactions to both of those comments. Well, yes, I think the um, Davos is what Davos is. Davos is the established order. Davos is uh, the very comfy, collegial, country clubbish uh, association of, of comfortable CEOs and, um, and their government counterparts. And this is a conference that's not for them. This is a conference that is for regular individuals who are trying to navigate uh, economic conditions that are increasingly challenging and confusing. Yeah. So they're, they're first responders in the sense that um, as a group they, they understand that some things about the way the markets function have changed and they want to be out in front of those changes so that they're not, they're not victimized by them. Yeah, a lot has changed, that's for sure. Let's get into all of this. First, a lot of concerning headlines today coming out of Europe and it's a good point. People don't know these days how to weigh the mood Angela Merkel may be in when they're making their investment decisions, which is something you have to factor in increasingly, arguably. Meanwhile, U.S. Treasury yields today, Eric, they fell to an all-time record low on all ends of the spectrum. The 10-year traded below 1.4 percent, the 30-year below 2.48 percent. But instead of being lulled to sleep, you do not think the U.S should be asleep. You think that the U.S. should learn from a cautionary tale from the extinction of the Irish elk. First, Eric, what happened to the Irish elk? Well, um, the Irish elk was a, was a maladaptive species, ultimately. So the Irish elk um, had enormous antlers, and the antlers were, according to one theory of its, of its, its, its extinction, were uh, a major component of the, the sexual attraction of the males. So it was a big part of sexual selection. The, uh, apparently, the female Irish elk dug male elks with big antlers. <laughs> so um, as, as that process proceeded, uh, the, the large antlered elk would have large antlered offspring, and they would grow larger and larger with successive generations. Uh, ultimately, you ended up with elk that had 100-pound antlers, and they were ill-suited to, uh, to forage. They were, could have trouble keeping their heads up. And according to the leading theory of their extinction, the antlers became so large, they contained 16 or so pounds of calcium, 8 pounds of phosphate, and the local grasses were insufficient to support that level of, of, of bone growth. Mm -hmm. So the elk... The elk, because of their antlers, developed a kind of osteoporosis and died off. Um, well, you know what they say. It's kind of like that. You know what that, they uh, say that about video from the early '90s. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right said Fred, mm -hmm. I'm too sexy for my cat. <laughs> too sexy for well. That's what happened with the with the elk. They became too sexy to survive. And in a way, the United States, I believe, is becoming uh, too sexy to thrive. We have been uh, the greatest power on the planet, economically, militarily, et cetera. And 
in order to maintain that power, we're literally feeding on ourselves mm -hmm. and, and building up enormous uh, debts and, um, and regulatory strictures that, are, that are, are making it difficult for us to, to even uh, maintain ourselves. Yeah, yeah, let's bring up the U.S. debt because that's a really big set of antlers the U.S. has in terms of how it's grown and become so oversized. So what, Eric, though, because we're not seeing this in Treasury yields, what are the maladaptive traits that we see developing as a result of these huge debt antlers? Well, I think, I, I think what's happening in the Treasury market is something that... Um, may not be directly related to, to maladaptation. It's rather a response by investors to, to changes in the marketplace. So um, as your guest, uh, Jim Grant, brought up last week, there, there's a bubble in safe haven assets. And I, I endorse that point of view. So you have negative yields on five-year Swiss bonds, negative yields on Danish debt, and, and invisible yields on German, US, and so on. So that's a response by investors to a very real um, disease, let's call it, in the global financial markets in which there is so much manipulation, so much, so much uh, fraud, so much uncertainty even as to, as to whether your brokerage account is going to be there tomorrow, yeah. that a lot of investors are making what I consider a rational choice in, in putting their money somewhere where they at least believe they'll get it back. Right. The worry about return of capital, not return on capital. How does price fixing, Eric, and the rigging of right. markets by the Fed and other monetary authorities in the West fit in here with the maladaptation and the antlers becoming too big? Well, um, it's, it's a, a late-stage phenomenon, it, it feels to me, in the Western world, where if we look at Europe and, and the U.S. exclusively, um, these, are, these were the powers that emerged from the Second World War, and they, were, they emerged and, and strengthened throughout the ensuing decades because they were relatively free market societies. And the U.S. has been a free market society for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so a, as those economies have progressed, they have become less free market oriented to the extent that the 08 crisis opened the door to government manipulation on a, on a monumental scale. So instead of, of doing what a healthy organism would do, which is to say, okay, uh, I, got, I took a, a trauma blow or I got sick, I'm going to just heal. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, We've been dosing ourselves. The governments have been involved in, in sending bailouts to every possible place they could send a bailout, mm -hmm. running up debts in the process. They have been manipulating almost every single credit market, whether it's sovereign debt, whether it's the debt of financial institutions, whether it is um, mortgage debt, now student loan debt, and the list goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Let's, to the let's extent actually, that yeah, a let's, real world mm -hmm. investor is, is, inca Go ahead. is incapable of, of determining, okay, well, what's a real price? What's a real value? What's a real anything? And um, not knowing, they, they choose not to participate. Right. And I want to bring up, we have an endangered species list of uh, the endangered species of free market prices. So, Eric, I guess my question for you is what's not on that? What is priced accurately. Anything? Well, um, as I, I, I wrote about a week ago, when, you, when it comes to LIBOR, which is the basis of trillions of dollars of, of loans and securities, some have even estimated as high as 500 trillion, which is a number that's so high it's, it's hard to even believe. Once you start messing around with LIBOR, uh, it is akin to, to moving magnetic north or moving a GPS system. You literally don't know where you're going to land mm -hmm. or, or, or what direction you're heading. Mm -hmm. So um, is something not rigged? OK, you could say, you could say uh, a home price isn't, isn't rigged, maybe. But then, but then the investment value of a home relates directly back to interest rates. Interest rates relate directly back to 
Fed funds, which is manipulated by the Federal Reserve, and to LIBOR, which is manipulated by the Federal Reserve, perhaps, and by traders in, for certain. So all asset values somehow fluctuate around these interest rates of, of, of dubious value. Right. And so you're saying people are saying, OK, I want to take my hands off this steering wheel. I don't want to drive this car. This is too scary. I don't know where I'm going. There are no free market price signals. So in this environment, I know I read you said fear is a meaningful insight. I guess I want to know if you think there's a proper response. Well, I think fear is a meaningful insight with respect to the financial markets broadly. Mm -hmm. um, so. I mean, you know, again, Jim Grant was on your show talking about growing walnuts. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it almost gets to the point where you have to go, you have to go so low tech and so extreme in some ways in order to find markets that, that are relatively untouched. So um, a walnut tree would be an example. But uh, beyond that, there are agricultural markets that are still relatively uh, untouched. There's, there are a number of real estate markets that are untouched. There are private partnerships that, that devote themselves to facets of the, of the credit markets that are relatively untouched. Um, and, and by those facets, I mean there are, there are mortgage-backed securities that are offering high yields. Um, those had been manipulated and had been um, influenced by, the, by both traders and by central banks, but at the moment, less so. Mm -hmm. So there are little pockets of opportunity where investors can, um, can look for a non-manipulated financial asset and hope for something um, better than 1.3% from a 10-year treasury. Yeah, better than nothing. And along That's this what the conference here is all about, by the way. Is, is, that, is the quest for that kind of thing. Is, is what? The quest for what? No, I'm saying that's what this conference is about. It's, it's about trying to find the, the sort of alternative assets, the fair assets uh, that have a, a chance of providing a return uh, away from the manipulation of, of uh, Western governments and, and agencies. Isn't that crazy that that's, that that's what it's come to, trying to figure out where these pockets are that aren't manipulated, that actually are fair and are subject to the free market. And we're looking at walnut trees and farms and other things like that. Before we go, I want to talk about in this atmosphere of fear, there are some responses that kick in when you're afraid. There's fight and there's flight. And in Europe, I thought it was interesting because you've been talking about the difference between both of these spectrums in regards to one country and one investment. You have German bun yields, which are at record lows, but yet you show that it's more expensive, or it was at a point, to insure against German default. It was more expensive to do that than to insure against default of, of instruments that were rated much lower. You compared it to Viacom. So these are two really different stories, but they're both revolving around the same country, the same bond market. So. How are you supposed to know what to do there? Or, or what does this tell us, even, that there's these different fight well, and flight scenarios? Yeah, that's uh, right. Without, without b being too arcane, uh, yeah, yeah, German bond yields are very, very low, just like treasuries. But the price of insuring German debt is very, very high, higher than the debt of lowly rated US corporates. So that's, that's an anomaly, a conundrum. And um, does it mean something? Yeah, it means the financial markets are crazy. Uh, <laughs> it means it's very difficult to, to figure out how to, how to position yourself in, in, in a safe way. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to uh, say uh, there's nothing to do here. Uh, there are things to do, but they're at the margin. Mm -hmm. and, and at the core of things that used to be safe, I, I think you have you have great risk. Things that are perceived to be safe are actually, in fact, risky. And the solution is relatively simple. The solution is to, is to allow free markets to operate freely. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the moment, the powers that be in Europe and the U.S. have zero desire to do right. that. They have All every right. desire to step in and, and to fix manipulate. Things. Absolutely. And as long as that's the case. Eric Fry, I'm so sorry I have to interrupt and cut right. you off, well, but I really appreciate you being on the show. Oh, no I guess uh, big antlers, what you've heard about them, aren't true. Thanks so much, Eric Fry, editor of The Daily Reckoning. <laughs>
And still ahead, record high yield on Spanish bonds. The IMF may be wanting to dump Greece, the euro falling, a ban on short selling in Spain and Italy. And those are just the headlines you've probably seen widely reported coming out of Europe. Coming up after the break, Mike Shedlock will tell us the alarming news you haven't heard. But first, your closing market numbers. What drives the world? The fear-mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State-controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT question more. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. Welcome to the Alona Show, where you'll get the real headlines with none of the mercy. The problem with the mainstream media today is that they're completely disconnected from the viewers and from what actually matters to those viewers. And so that's why young people just don't watch TV anymore. If they want news, they go online and read it. But we're trying to take those stories that people actually care about and transfer them back to TV. Where do I begin with Europe today? There are just, there's been an onslaught of headlines, all bad pretty much that I've seen coming out of Europe indicating that the sustainable solution or at least the pretending that there was a sustainable solution has once again run out as we knew would happen. We see Spanish yields spiking. We see the IMF saying, hey, maybe we want out of Greece as soon as you Europeans have your other funds all set up and ready to go. And those are just a few of the headlines. But what about the ones that you haven't seen widely reported? Mike Shedlock has been diving into those. He's investment advisor for Sika Pacific Capital, and he is going to tell us all of this really good dirt that you need to know that that somehow has escaped the headlines because probably there's just so many already. Thanks so much, Mike Shedlock, Mish, for being on the show today. Oh, pleasure to be back on the show, Lauren. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's nice to see you. You look very happy given how much bad news is coming out of Europe, but maybe that's because you've largely been right about Europe all along. And here are some indications that are kind of on the periphery but are really interesting that you're writing about. Mish, I haven't heard about Black Monday in Italy, but you have, and you're talking about messages on Facebook and Twitter that have gone viral. So what is Black Monday and why is this significant in your view? Oh, uh, Black Monday was really just a reference to the markets. They were, they were, Europe got hammered today. Spain was at, at one point down 5%. Actually, it recovered to be a finish only down a percent or percent and a half or something. But in Italy, um, I've, got, I've got contacts all over Europe, and, and they send me these links, and they might be in uh, German, or they might be in Italian, or they might be in Spanish. I get links from a guy named Bran almost every day uh, from Spain. But today I got one from Italy, and um, it was from a, uh, a website that was at an Italian website that was talking about uh, messages going viral out there on Twitter and on Facebook, and uh, it's it's panic. And, and and one person said on Twitter, "Enough of this agony. Just please give us back the lira." So th that's what social media is saying in uh, Europe. It's actually not very pretty if you follow that through. That's interesting. How do you weigh the anecdotal evidence on social media, I guess the Twitter indicator, if you will, uh, against other bits of news and information that you have coming in? Well, actually, we'll just look at yields. I mean, they're absolutely soaring across the board uh, today, uh, almost up 100 basis points. That's one full percentage point from 5.5% to 6.5%. 
um, in Spain today on the two-year uh, Treasury. The 10-year Treasury hit 7.5%, uncharted territory. What was it, Lauren? Uh, three weeks ago, uh, Rajoy, the Prime Minister of Spain, was saying crisis solved. Yeah. yeah, that lasted, what, three weeks? Now we're seeing it in Italy, and the mood has really gotten you know, pretty extreme there. They're blaming President Obama. They're blaming IMF. They're blaming the Bilderberg. They're blaming everyone. And we're seeing the rise of the five star movement. And I'm really stunned about this one, uh, Lauren, because I don't understand why this is not made front page news in the Wall Street Journal yet, but I think it will. This uh, Beppe Grio, who is a uh, politician or an anti politician almost, running for office in, uh, in Italy, and he's running on a platform that uh, says, you know, we're going to kick out all these politicians. And his own personal viewpoint is we need to get off of, uh, uh, of the euro and default on it. Hmm. You know, that's pretty big news. And, and you don't hear a lot about it, Lauren. That is pretty big news. I feel like there is a sense that, for whatever reason, I haven't really just heard about Italy much. It's kind of been not, I guess, the problem child to du jour the way that maybe Spain has been recently. But another thing you point out about Italy is 10 cities, major cities that are on the verge of collapse. So what is really at stake here? Does that mean more pressure for the federal government? Does that mean that despite the efforts to prop up Italy, it's still crumbling from within? What, what, do, you, what do you take from that? Well, 10 cities, including uh, Milan, Naples, 10 big cities, 10 major cities, actually a whole slew of smaller ones, they claim, have already gone uh, a bit in the dust. And they're, they're talking about d defaulting on, on their debt. Meanwhile, the state, the, the federal government of Italy, is, is demanding more taxes, you know, more austerity measures, more firings. Um, so, you know, where does it end? I think it's going to end in protests in the streets. And uh, when, when Spain had the protests last week, I said, Italy's next. I think we're going to see it. And that's what they were tweeting about today, mm -hmm. saying, you know, we're going to organize some protests here. It's going to spill over into Italy. And, and right now, look at it. Mm -hmm. Greece is blowing up. Spain's blowing up. Italy's blowing up all at once. And uh, the 19th Euro Summit has already broke down, uh, Lauren. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, 20th breakdown is on the way. They're going to they're going to declare another summit. But what can they do? What's it going to do? Yeah, I mean, there doesn't seem like a lot that they can do. I'm with you there. But I'm curious what you think is the relevance of protests in the streets of Italy because we've seen them all over Europe. And I hate to sound like a callous person, but it doesn't seem like any amount of protests I've seen in the street there have translated into any kind of pressure for politicians. They still pass austerity. They still do what the international lenders want at the end of the day. So what difference would it make? Well, I actually it made a difference in Greece. I, you know, look at uh, the, the radical left went from what, five or six percent to real close to winning that election. Mm -hmm. I I'm waiting for the time, Lauren, where some politician is going to stand up in front of the voters and say, this Euro treaty is <laughs> null and void. We're going to default on the euro. That person, someone's going to come along and say that, Lauren, and that person's going to get elected. Aha, uh -huh. there's a prediction there. I want a prediction from you on this too, Mish, because you mentioned the Spanish yields and a key uh, Spanish yield going above 7% to 7.5%. But we've seen this before. We've seen Spain get to this dangerous 7% yield price. I'm curious, at what point is there the turning point where Spain can no longer borrow from the markets and where Spain does need a bailout? It's there right now. It's going to happen. I, I believe the consensus opinion right now is that, that that is exactly what's going to happen. Bear in mind that Germany flirted with, uh, excuse me, Greece <laughs> flirted uh, with that 7.5%. Uh, yeah, major mistake there. The Greece uh, uh, flirted with that 7.5% uh, for a while. They, they came in. Uh, the president of the ECB, Jean-Claude Trichet at the time, you know, how many victory parties, uh, celebrations did they have over? Greece before Greece finally imploded. And we've seen a number of these same celebrations here uh, uh, over uh, in, in Spain. 
and, and, and denials. They were denying today, you know, we've had so many denials. How many official denials do you have to have before the country really implodes? And I think we're there. I, I think it's uh, Spain is on the verge of, of a huge breakdown here. I think Italy's going to follow. And there's not enough money in the ESM or the EFSF to bail them all out. So what are they going to do? We're at a crisis moment here. I expect they're going to announce another summit probably this weekend. Mm -hmm. We'll see. What, what are they going to come up with? Is there, is there another rabbit left in the hat? I, I don't think so. Well, I've said that before. But I'll say it again. At, at some point, the hat runs out of rabbits. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's getting close to that, that key rabbit moment where there are no more little bunnies left to pull out. But you say there's not enough money to bail out Spain and Italy. But is there even enough money to bail out Spain? Because arguably, isn't there not enough money? No, there's not. I, I, I don't see. I mean, they're talking 100 uh, billion euros. But what's it really going to be? I think it's probably going to be closer to 300, 400, maybe more. And it, it, this is, we're talking about a situation where we're talking about a bailout. This thing's not even funded. It, it's not even passed muster in the Constitutional Court of Germany. I, I don't know how they're going to rule. I think that ruling is coming up uh, September 12th or 13th, something like that. So, and already they're adding to what they want the ESM to do. Well, it's not even yet ratified in Germany. Mm -hmm. the, the constitutional court's not agreed to it. And if they do agree to it, you can bet your bottom dollar, they're going to say, you're not raising this uh, uh, above, you know, 500 billion. This is it. Figure it out. Well, what happens then when 500 billion isn't enough? This is why all this pressure on Merkel is just misguided. Mm -hmm. Everyone in Europe is expecting Merkel to be able to do all of these things she can't. She can't. She can't there's, if she wanted to. There's not enough money. I mean, she's not Miss Universe. She can't save everybody. And uh, it's very questionable if we're at that point where anybody can really be saved anymore. Mike Shedluck, I appreciate you being here to talk about all of that. That remains to be seen, too, if that report that the IMF uh, wants to dump Greece as soon as the ESM is all approved is going to hold 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 muster if that is actually true. The IMF came out with kind of a, a weird cryptic statement after that. So we'll have to see. But thanks so much. That was Mike Shedlock, investment advisor for Sika Pacific Capital. And that is all we have time for. That's our show today. Thank you so much for watching and make sure to come back tomorrow. And in the meantime, you can always follow me on Twitter and you can give us feedback on youtube.com slash capital account or catch any shows you missed, missed on Hulu at hulu.com slash capital dash account from everyone here. Thanks for watching and have a great night.